Hey everyone and welcome back. Happy 2024. Today we're going to talk about something you should never ever do to your Harley Davidson. Not only your Harley, but your lawnmower, your car, your motorized bicycle, anything that burns gasoline. It's winter and a lot of these mechanical devices are stuffed back in storage quite often. Those of you that own these mechanical devices think that you're doing yourselves a favor and doing your machine a favor by doing this one thing that I'm going to tell you you should never ever do. So stick around and we'll talk about it. Before we get started, I'm going to encourage you to go back. I think it was about a year, uh, maybe two years ago, man, this, this crazy move and everything, as you guys know, has... Uh, anyway... I don't know if I did the video a year, year and a half ago, two years ago, whatever, about winterizing your motorcycle. We talked about some of the clots, oils, and we I think we talked about, uh, you know, using face separators for ethanol fuels. We talked about their, you know, storage additive that you put in it and everything else. So I would like to encourage you guys to search back about a, I think it was a year or two ago, probably two years, that I did a video on that. So the one thing you never want to do to your Harley-Davidson motorcycle, we're going to get to that. But the first thing I want to do so you understand where I'm coming from with this, let's think about what happens when you cold start an engine. This applies to generators, motorcycles, cars. It doesn't matter. If it's an internal combustion engine, it's irrelevant as to what that engine's purpose is. Regardless, the same thing happens. When it's cold outside, or you're first and initially starting in an internal combustion engine, one thing that it has to do is deliver a massive amount of fuel in order to start combustion in that cold environment. Cold internal combustion engines require significantly more fuel to start than when they do to run when they're at normal operating temperature. Okay, so if you have a carbureted bike, the first thing you do is you pull the choke. You wick it two or three times, you fire it off. And then that gets the engine running. And slowly and progressively, you may push that, that choke in and push it in a little more and a little more until the engine reaches normal operating temperature. Now let's talk about fuel-injected stuff. Fuel-injected bikes or cars or whatever, they all work the same. When you turn on your switch, the engine temperature sensor sees what the engine temperature is. And then your intake air temperature sensor knows what the incoming air temperature is. And it sees that it's cold. It's much colder. You know, it's cold. It's, and you're not at normal operating temperature. So the first thing that happens when you hit that button on a fuel-injected internal combustion engine, it gives it a dose of what they call priming fuel. It goes, and it sprays a bit of fuel. That's to wet the manifold, wet the valves, wet the intake ports, and get everything ready to fire when you finally hit that button. That's called a blast of priming fuel. That's the same thing as you going on your carbureted bikes. You pulling your choke out is exactly the same thing that fuel injection does. It has a certain amount of cranking fuel, so it sprays a large amount of cranking fuel into that engine to give it a lot of fuel so it'll fire off like that. And then once that engine starts, you also have a much richer fuel mixture during the warm-up process than what you have while it's running at normal operating temperature. It's no different than you operating your carbureted generator, motorcycle, whatever, with the choke pulled part way out. And as the engine heats up, you slowly push that choke in. In other words, again, you have to deliver more fuel to a cold engine than you do a hot engine. It's how it works. That's an important aspect of what I'm about to tell you. The one thing you should never do, I know it's winter storage and a lot of bikes are sitting in garages. And I know you guys get the itch. You want to hear your motorcycle run because it's cold outside in extreme environments up north and stuff, snow, ice on the ground and things. You really want to be able to at least hear your motorcycle to give you warm and fuzzy and make you feel good. The truth of the matter is, guys, never go into your garage and crank your motorcycle up to just let it idle for 10 minutes or so, 5, 10 to 15 minutes, hopefully no longer than that. 
and you just want to hear it. So you run it for a few minutes and then you shut it off and you walk away from it for a week or two weeks or three weeks and then you do it again and you do it repetitively. Never, ever do that. Here's why. Several reasons. The first off, one of the things that occurs, of course, is condensation. When you have a large variance in temperature, the engine heats up a little bit during your idle cycle and then it cools back down and then you heat it back up again and back and forth, you can begin to develop condensation on the inside of that engine. Can that condensation not only affect the ferrous metals that are inside there, being your bearings, your cylinder liners, uh, connecting rods, you know, all the basically magnetic ferrous materials in there and cause them to rust. That's problem number one. Number two, every time you start that engine, you're giving it this huge blast of fuel. That huge blast of fuel temporarily washes down the cylinder walls and potentially any other ferrous metal component that's in there. So you, you're supplying an overly rich fuel mixture you're blasting that thing with every single key start with gasoline. Gasoline will dilute your oil mixture. So you already have an oil dilution coming from excess fuel. You also have it from condensation that builds up every single heating and cooling cycle as you start that engine and let it cool down. It can do massive destruction on the inside of an engine to just crank it and warm it up just a little bit and shut it down. It can cause a lot of problems. It can, again, rust your cylinder liners and any other ferrous metal that's in there. So it's a compounding effect is what I'm getting at here. You have not only the condensation which can promote rust and corrosion. The second aspect of it is that you're also giving it this blast of fuel with one restart after another that is also diluting your oil mixture, specifically on the cylinder walls. When you do that and you wash down those cylinder walls, it is making those cylinder liners more susceptible to rust due to condensation because you don't have oil in those cylinder walls. The best advice I could give you, do not crank your motorcycle, your generator, your car, whatever the case may be, unless you intend on riding it for an extended period of time, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, something to that effect. And the idea is, you know, you have your crankcase ventilation system. A large part of a crankcase ventilation system is not only to evacuate gases from the combustion process, but it's also to evacuate moisture that builds up inside the engine case and any cavity that's in there. So what you'd want to do is essentially don't crank it unless you intend on running it for a long period of time. 30 minutes, 45 minutes, etc. Actually, on the road, you want to be able to get that engine up to an operating temperature and operate it at operating temperature for a long period of time. That gives the engine its opportunity and all any condensation that's built up, not only inside the air environment that's there, but also inside the oil. It gives it time to mist, time to separate, time to go from a more liquid state into a gaseous state and it gets hot enough that those gases, that moisture, that humidity can be exhausted from the engine through your crankcase ventilation system. The only way to do that is with running it at elevated temperatures and that gets it out of there. Now I'll give you a real world example, real world example. One very well known person in this industry that's been in the motorcycle industry as long as I've been alive. He called me several weeks ago. He said, Kevin, I have an Evolution engine. I've had it stored for a couple of years. I sold it to someone. They started it up and wanted to, you know, put it on a dyno and kind of see the health of the engine. He said, it's blowing white smoke everywhere. Think about that. White smoke. Blowing white smoke everywhere. He says, Kevin, what could this possibly be? And I said, well, did you change the oil before you fired it up and put it on the dyno and put load on it and do all these other things? Well, no, we didn't change the oil. And then I said, so it's white smoke, not blue smoke, not black smoke, not tan smoke, right? 
Yes. So I asked, well, what's the common thing we know? If we see white smoke coming from an exhaust pipe of a car, what do we know? We know that car has maybe a blown head gasket. We've got a problem with the cooling system, something like that. Water is getting into the oil or into the cylinder somehow, and that's producing white smoke, essentially steam. Well, we're dealing with an evolution. It is not a liquid cooled engine. So there has to be some way moisture got inside that engine. He said it's been stored inside. No water has gotten inside of it. And obviously it's not a liquid cooled engine by any means. And my response to him was, I guarantee you that in a weekly or bi-weekly basis, you probably went out to your barn, storage shed, garage, and you fired that motorcycle up and let it run for five to 10 minutes and you'd shut it down. And you've probably done that every weekend or every month for the past couple of years it's been in storage. And his response was, how did you know that? The reality is the white smoke he was seeing, and he lives in a, an extreme northern climate. The white smoke he was seeing was the buildup of condensation and moisture inside that engine and inside the oil from those repetitive cycles of almost hot enough and then cold. Almost hot enough and cold. And after I advised him to change his oil, he changes his oil, they run the bike, and miraculously it's no longer puffing out white smoke. And they could in fact see from the oil they drained there was a lot of moisture in that oil. So I would say a valuable lesson learned. Now keep in mind, if you do this enough and a bike has been stored for a long time, you can then actually create damage, pitting surface rust inside the cylinder walls. Once you do that, you have compromised piston ring integrity. And very much like I've talked about, piston rings can act very much like windshield wipers on a car. Once they skip, once, they do it forever. You guys know what I'm talking about. That's a highly technical noise, by the way. Piston rings can do the same thing. If you have a section of cylinder that has a lot of surface, maybe minor surface rust, maybe a little bit of pitting on it or something like that, if that piston ring skips over that and it creates the slightest microscopic nick on that ring, that can progress. And then just you begin to develop those skips in the cylinder wall against the piston ring very much like you do a windshield wiper on a windshield. So all of that being said, my motorcycling friends, never, ever, ever start your motorcycle unless you intend on riding it getting it up to operating temperature and maintaining that operating temperature for a period of time, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, maybe an hour. That gives you the opportunity to evacuate all that moisture out of the engine case, all that moisture out of the oil, and it will lead to a much, much better engine and a safer restart when it starts getting warmer outside and you fire it up to go ride. That's the best advice I can give you guys for how to store your motorcycle. All that said, we've got a bunch of bikes in here. You guys have been on the waiting list. So thank you so much again for your patience, your kinder, your your candor, your kindness. Uh, we've got engines tore down. We're rocking and rolling, man. And uh, we've still got quite a bit of work ahead of us. But uh, all of you guys that are on the backlog, you've been so kind and patient. And thank you so much for that. Uh, the delays were vastly unexpected i tell you it's crazy i love it up here but oh man <laughs> anyway uh i also want to give give a big thank you to all of our members for you guys hanging in there you know you hang in there every single month and you support this channel in every way i want to thank all of you for your kind your comments and and your support it continues on and and uh what i would uh if you guys don't mind in the comments section down here not only members but members uh, no, channel members, excuse me, but also regular viewers. Uh, I would like to do some lives again, maybe do some Q&As. So if, for those of you that are members, if you'll drop me some comments in here and let me know, give me some ideas of times, what you like. I know we've bounced back and forth from, you know, doing them on Sunday mornings. We did them on Thursday afternoons, Tuesday afternoons. It was kind of all over the place. So I'd like to hear what you think would be a good time to do a live Q&A specifically for channel members. We want to get down to nitty gritty for you guys. Uh, and then also everyone else that's, that's uh, viewers and subscribers, if you guys would like to throw down a comment, let me know when a good time for you would be for us to do a big channel one and just talk generic stuff. That would be awesome too, so I appreciate it. Happy New Year. Happy 2024. I hope you guys are doing well. Hope that everyone's warm and fat and happy and all those great things. And uh, take care of yourselves and each other. 
We'll see you in another week or two. Have a good one.